You're listening to the Cancer Assist Podcast. Wherever you are in your experience, we are here to provide help and hope as you navigate cancer prevention, treatment, and care. Hosted by Dr. Bill Evans and brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Help when you really need it. Well, welcome to the Cancer Assist Show with Dr. Bill Evans. I'm delighted that you've joined to listen to this podcast today. If you're a first-time listener, I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it from our guest. We're going to be focusing on cancer pain, something that cancer patients really, I think, worry about intensely, and we're going to try and put to bed some of the myths and also give some good advice about the kinds of medication and other supports that are necessary for patients who have pain. Now, we do this podcast for the Cancer Assistance Program here in Hamilton, and this organization does a lot of things to help cancer patients in our region, including providing free rides, providing uh, various forms of equipment to help keep patients safe in their homes and allow them to have mobility and uh, a better quality of life and there's supports for their nutrition, uh, food packages, uh, mastectomy supplies, many other things that the Cancer Assistance Program uh, does. So if you're new to the Cancer Center at the Chervinsky Cancer Center, make sure that you uh, are aware of what the Cancer Assistance Program can provide for you in addition to listening to this podcast. And today I'm really delighted to to welcome uh, Deb uh, Evans, uh, no relation, another <laughs> Evans, but common name of good people, I guess. <laughs> and Deb uh, is a, a specialist who works with p- cancer patients and helping them manage their pain. So welcome to the program, Deb. Uh, thank you, Bill. I Maybe you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. How do you end up in this particular area? Because many people would say, I guess, uh, cancer must be depressing and managing people with pain must be even worse. So how did you, over the course of your career, end up in this particular field? I think uh, way back I was working as a visiting nurse and I did it for a few years. And a large percentage of the patients that I ended up seeing ended up being cancer patients. And they had multi um, multiple types of problems that I found interesting. And I felt like there was a good way where I could really contribute and help to make a difference for people. So um, I started to shape my career towards that. I did some working in uh, an inpatient cancer floor mm-hmm. to develop that knowledge. I'd gotten my master's so that I... Um, uh, could apply for the what's called the clinical nurse specialist role in pain and symptom management, and I've been doing that for the last 15 years at the Jurabinsky Cancer Center. Wow, so that's a good long time and a <laughs> lot of experience under your belt uh, with 15 years of managing individuals with cancer pain. Now, let's put one myth to, to bed immediately. Not all cancer patients experience pain, right? No, they don't. There will cancer pain expression really varies across patients. Um, sometimes you'll look at somebody's scans and think, "Oh, they should be in a lot of pain," and they're not. And there are just many th- individual things that can um, affect how we feel and experience pain. And there are different types of of pain. I think that's another important distinction to make, so that people understand there's uh, pain that's. Uh, coming from deep organs, which maybe mm-hmm. has a sort of dull, achy comparison to, compared to, uh, say, a, a, a broken bone mm-hmm. uh, weakened by uh, cancer, where the pain would have a different characteristic altogether. And, and that that's true. And also uh, another type of pain that tends to be common is what we call a neuropathic pain, that shooting, burning type pain. And, you know, it's really important to try in the assessment piece for the the professional to figure out what kind of pain you're dealing with because that can really influence the strategies that we can use to try and help that help get your pain under better control because opioids or pain medications like morphine hydromorphone um, oxycodone are only one type of medication there are many other things both medication and non-medication that can help to get your pain under control. Um, So that's a really important point for people to be aware of. It isn't that we immediately leap to narcotics to mm -hmm. deal with cancer pain, that the type of pain, its origin, uh, may be well 
uh, affected by something much more simple. Mm -hmm. Even acetaminophen, mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of things can make a huge difference, right? For many patients, <coughs> Tylenol or over-the-counter um, anti-inflammatories can be a good place to start. Um, one of the things in the last few years that I've really felt that we underutilize is also things like physio and occupational therapy to help people to make sure they're um, physically doing activities in a way that's not going to evoke as much pain and that with occupational therapy we're looking for assistive devices that might help reduce pain. So I often will say to patients that medication is only one tool in our box that we have to manage pain. Very interesting because uh, I don't tend to think about occupational therapy, physiotherapy as being part of pain management, but as you've just described it, 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 it makes perfect sense and, mm -hmm. and it's probably underutilized. Um, interestingly, we have now have an occupational therapist on the board of Cancer Systems <laughs> Program, and so we're, I guess we're getting our awareness heightened more and, and uh, perhaps through these podcasts, heightening the awareness of physicians that there are other professionals to be brought mm -hmm. in to help manage cancer pain. So maybe just step back a bit and talk a little bit about what causes pain. A whole variety of things. I think for most patients who are diagnosed with cancer, um, what initially will cause the pain is the tumor itself. So it, it may be a mass that, um, I mean, I had a patient yesterday where it was diagnosed because a bone broke because they had a tumor in the bone. Uh, for some patients, the tumor is pressing, and it may be pressing on organs, it may be pressing on nerves. Um, there's some thinking that some of the, the chemicals that the cancer releases can cause an inflammatory type reaction. So um, those things specific to the cancer are what cause pain, but then we have to look at people's previous experiences with pain. So often I say, you know, patients come to us with a variety of health conditions that predated their cancer. So they may have many chronic conditions such as arthritis or fibromyalgia or other types of situations that also contribute to the pain um, and may influence how they experience their cancer pain as well. So you're saying if you've had, um, you know, fibromyalgia for many years, how you will experience a cancer patient or cancer pain will be different than if you never had that kind of experience before. Yep. Yep. And does it make it more intense or, or, or brings on different psychological reactions to the pain? I think it's a bit of both. It, it certainly uh, can make it much more complex to manage. Um, and depending on how the management of their fibromyalgia or their arthritis or any of these other conditions has been prior to that, you know, what I often will say to patients is if you've been in pain for a long time, it can make it harder to manage the pain because it changes um, the receptors in your body that experience and transmit those messages to your brain as well. So, I guess one of the problems clinically I used to encounter when seeing patients is individuals who had some background of aches and pains and then they get cancer but they still will have those other aches and pains that are unrelated to the cancer. Mm -hmm. But now that they've got cancer, they think that it might be due to the cancer recurring or getting worse. And you're always having to sort out in the clinic, <laughs> is this truly a uh, change in the cancer and they need some more treatment or something? So people need scans and other investigations mm -hmm. to sort out. Oh, I, I'm sure there's just an awful lot of investigation done because yeah. people, we all have aches and pains every day right so but we don't have cancer but when mm -hmm. we have cancer and we have our aches and pains now we start to think maybe that's due to the cancer and we get concerned about it yeah there's two thoughts that come to my mind I'm going to deal with yours first I think that because for most patients pain is what brought them to get diagnosed with cancer so even once they're complete of completed their treatment any pain that occurs just becomes this thing that creates so much anxiety because they feel that that pain must be related to disease returning. And what we actually know is that the treatments we give people 
can actually give them chronic pain conditions. The, the tumor itself, where it was and what it was pressing on, may give people a chronic pain condition that isn't really related to their cancer coming back, but is real nonetheless. And it has to be managed. Okay. Correct, yes. And your other thought that you... I, I think I folded it in there, is that our treatments do... So some of the chemotherapies that we've used typically can give people fairly significant uh, what we call chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, which yes. is numbness and pain in their fingers and their toes and feet. And some of the radiation treatments we give can also give people some... Uh, uh, nerve issues because they've da damaged the nerves in the field where they actually radiated. So um, those things are also very real and aren't going to need to be managed over time. Yeah, so there's the cancer-related pain and then there's the treatment-related pain. And, and you, you missed the first one, which is a surgical pain. Oh, cause, yep. Because <laughs> most patients will have, or many of them anyway, will have surgery at the time yep. of diagnosis or maybe the definitive treatment. And of course, there's always some degree of post-operative pain with that. So there's there's both sides to this, and and I guess this then kind of logically leads uh, to thinking about the, the approaches to it and where we've kind of got into trouble, I guess, in in the medical profession about the prescription of of pain medicines, and I I, I think in particular around post-operative pain management. It's pretty easy to put people on high-powered drugs that are addictive and, and maybe hard to get some of them off of those drugs. Hence the whole worry that we're maybe misusing opioids mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, I mean, certainly the research would say that um, post-operatively we actually tend to send patients home with too big a number of opioids, we're giving them far more pills than people actually need or will use. And so having them in the home can create problems if people misuse them. The difficulty I think we're facing over the last couple of years is um, there have been a lot of measures in place to try and increase safety around the use of opioids. Um, and I think even among professionals, we don't understand that a lot of what's been put in place is to manage what's called chronic non-cancer pain. But the same principles that have been created for the chronic non-cancer pain are being applied by many uh, specialties to cancer patients, and it's often uh, not appropriate and not sufficient to get their pain under control. Um, but it, it's out of this increased concern about using opioids. And you referenced the research about <clears throat> people having a too large a prescription after surgery. I, I think I saw a reference to over 50% too much. Yeah. So it's a substantial uh, amount of over-prescribing of, of opioids and then about 10% of, of people... Uh, then becoming addicted yep. to those opioids. So it has been a serious problem, and I guess it continues to be a serious problem, hence rules and regulations to try and uh, uh, minimize the risk of people becoming addicted. But with this negative spillover that when people really need it, now it's becoming terribly hard to, to prescribe appropriately. But there is sort of a, uh, I guess they've called it an analgesic ladder, right, mm -hmm. so of, mm -hmm. of uh, or starting with pain that isn't too serious, starting at one level of the ladder and then working up if the pain increases in intensity or is poorly controlled. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I, I'm gonna just step back. I don't wanna lose a thought. So I think one of the first things that's really important um, before we give somebody an opioid prescription is that we're assessing what their risk is. It isn't just the individual risk. It may be the environmental risk. So it's do they have people with addiction history or capacity in their environment? Do they have a previous history? Are there other factors that make them at higher risk? And ensure that when we're starting those situations that we have honest discussions with pac patients and we put parameters in place to monitor things. So it's not that somebody who's had a history of 
problematic substance use can't be managed with opioids. It just needs to be very intentional with lots of safety mechanisms put in place. That's a really important point, and and I would hazard that most physicians don't take the time to sort out that family history and uh, personal history of the person's use of drugs and maybe their psychological state, Mm -hmm. whether they're prone to abuse substances, etc. And one of the reasons we have specialists like Mm -hmm. yourself to to actually uh, probe into these matters and and think about them more thoroughly, uh, because too often in busy clinics and practices, you pick up your pen and you write the prescription mm-hmm. and you don't ask those, those relevant questions that might uh, be very important as to whether a person went on to become you know, addicted to the, the, the substance you're prescribing. That's, that's a really important point. And you notice I skipped over it because <laughs> <laughs> I, being a clinician who's quick to move on, to, uh, I missed, missed that, uh, that whole important uh, psychosocial component of mm-hmm. prescribing. I I think uh, the other important thing we need to do with opioid prescribing, quite frankly, is we've given people these powerful medications and we have not provided them guidance on what safe and appropriate usage is. So one of the things that the Cancer Center I did was create, uh, it's basically a one-sheet handout that will say to patients, will tell patients things like, you should only be getting your opioid pain medication from one physician. You shouldn't be getting them from the family doctor, the pain doctor, the oncologist, because the more people that are involved, the more chance there is for problems. Um, Talks to them about not sharing. It talks to them about driving. It talks to them about not combining it with other medications that might Um, make them more prone to have breathing problems or to become too drowsy and fall and have accidents. It talks to them about safe storage. Um, And I think the other things is it talks to people that once you're done with the medication, it should go back to the pharmacy to be destroyed. Yes, not left in the cabinet or put down the toilet. Yep. And so I think Mm -hmm. all of those things add to making people safer using them if they really understand what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So how easily accessible is that information to patients? Is it just something that's handed out in the cancer center when they go through the a pain specialist like yourself yeah. or is it available on the cancer center's website? Um, I'm in the process right now of um, revising our opioid pain me- a handout for the Cancer Center, and in it, it includes all of those recommendations around the appropriate usage. Excellent. Well, I hope there's an educational component for yes. physicians in there because, um, not that I can speak for them, but I have a sense that there's a lot of learnings uh, embedded in mm-hmm. that that, mm-hmm. that most physicians have missed out on along the way. Now, I was interesting in my reading, there's some other kinds of pain too that we I didn't touch on, but I, I just in my reading, I thought were interesting, like pain that can be induced when you're giving um, granulocyte colony, uh, colony stimulating factors to raise the, the blood levels, uh, the white cell levels in people's blood. They can get a strong pain in the, in the bones uh, that yep. can last for a number of days. And, and uh, chemotherapy with a number of, you know, a number of the chemotherapy drugs like the taxanes can produce. Yeah. Uh, pains and I and I have a friend who's on aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer and getting terrible arthralgias and muscle pain. So a lot of the drugs that we use uh, to help treat the cancer or to support the the white blood cells uh, are also pain inducing, and mm-hmm. it's important that patients understand that so they're not confused with the idea that the cancer is progressing. Mm-hmm. But also we have to manage those pains as well, right? Well, and interestingly enough, most of those pains you talk about, opioids aren't the first line of defense for them. The The bone pain that comes from the drugs that stimulate your bone marrow to produce more white blood cells, um, often over-the-counter Tylenol will help, over-the-counter non-steroidal inflammatories. If you're able to use them, you have to be careful about using drugs like ibuprofen if you're on chemotherapy because 
um, they can increase your risk to bleed and that's worse if you're on a drug that already is going to impair your ability to stop bleeding. Um, you know, with the bone stimulating agents, it's actually a histamine uh, release that increases that bone pain. So sometimes an antihistamine can actually be more effective at helping that pain than anything else. So these are the subtleties of uh, mm -hmm. pain management that the, the average practitioner may not be aware of. Now, one of the things in the uh, cancer center that is, I think, a, a good way of sort of measuring how well a patient's doing from a pain point of view is the um, ESAS or Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale because if patients actually fill it out each time you would get a measure of whether their pain if they have that symptom is getting better getting worse and that a clear signal to the, the health care providers as to what they should be doing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and how do you find that in the cancer centers? Is it well used and the it is much better used uh, lately. We have rolled out, and many of you, if you check in for your cancer center appointments, will find that you're being told about the symptom screening. We used to um, have patients do it when they came for their appointments, and that was really uh, sometimes a bottleneck for people because they didn't want to wait. Uh, they wanted to get right into their doctor's appointment. So there's now lots of mechanisms where you can do that on home, on your cell phones um, while you're waiting or before you even come into the appointment. So the uptake of it is better. I like it when I look at it because I can see how things have changed over time. Because you can get a trend of uh, how yeah. they're scoring their pain in each uh, visit over time. Right? I, think, I think one of the <clears throat> difficulties both for um, patients and sometimes clinicians is understanding that that they'll go well what's a five what's a six you know and what i often say to patients is we we have this own our each have our own way of rating our pain so when you rate your pain as a six i'm not necessarily con um, comparing you to bill who might have rated his pain as a six or an eight um, what I'm looking for is if you come back and you've rated your pain as a four, then I know things have improved from when we first saw you. Um, so patients are afraid, like, if I put a number on it, how do I know that number's right? It isn't a right or wrong. It's just what makes sense to you. And it's more than just a physical rating. We know that lots of things go into determining how people rate a pain score. So you know, it can have to do with what we expect. So if I expect to have zero pain and I'm having pain, that can be quite distressing to me and I might rate that very highly. Um, where other people are saying, well, I expected to have a lot of pain and it's not as bad as I thought. So for me, it's a three or four. So when I look at the number, I talk to people and try and determine what went into that rating and and how the pain is impacting their life. I think there's some differences as well <clears throat> culturally in how mm -hmm. people think about pain, react to pain. Uh, some groups uh, almost seem to minimize it. Um, maybe it's in that culture, mm -hmm. consider a sign of weakness to acknowledge that you're suffering from pain. So I, I'm sure you see some of that as well. Certainly. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think I do always um, look at what pe people's cultural backgrounds are of having an understanding of that that can also play into how they rate their pain. Sorry. So assessing pain is a complicated thing on the one hand, uh, but mm -hmm. getting a charting of it over time is it certainly can give you clues mm -hmm. whether it's going in the right direction or the wrong direction. So... If... I don't want to interrupt you, but I please do. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in mind that you asked a question a while ago that I mm -hmm. never did answer, uh, and it it really was to do with um, there is a ladder or what we call a decision tree yes. for how yeah. we start pain medications, and so you know I think logically what we we do is that when people start and their pain is mild, we start them with over-the-counter things. We may start them with Tylenol. We may start them with over-the-counter things like ibuprofen or Robaxacet or any of those things that 
you know, can deal with a mild pain. If it's, um, I think really at whatever level it is, there are all these other kinds of medications we can use. Um, what the latter tells us is how to introduce and escalate opioids as the pain increases. So, you know, once you've tried over-the-counter things and they're not managing the pain, then we can go on to what's called a mild opioid. So those are things like your Tylenol 3s, your oxycosets. Um, and if the pain gets more severe, then we go on to the bigger opioids, the, <coughs> sorry, hydromorphone and morphine, uh, drugs like fentanyl, uh, and then as pain gets more complicated than even that, um, there is a whole new class of things we are starting to use more and more. Uh, some of them may be uh, referring you to uh, an interventional pain doctor who may be able to do something procedurally that'll help with your pain, inject a, um, a freezing medication in to try and block a nerve so that that message isn't getting sent through. Um, we use drugs, interestingly enough, uh, such as methadone. People have a feeling that methadone is just uh, for heroin withdrawal, but actually before it was ever used for that, it's a very good pain medication. And for people that are having very complex pain, it can actually be quite helpful at getting pain managed. And are there <coughs> combinations of drugs that you'd put together, like an anti-inflammatory plus? say a narcotic or, or uh, antidepressant uh, in some circumstances? Absolutely. Well? Um, I think uh, part of the when we do the assessment is asking a lot of questions about where the pain is and what it feels like and how often it comes is to help us determine what kind of pain you're having or what what the physiology is of the pain underneath because that can tell us what other kinds of medications we can use. So for neuropathic medication or pain, medications do tend to be um, a few drugs that are used specifically. They tend to be more the anticonvulsant class. So gabapentin, pregabalin are th those kinds of drugs or the antidepressants. So one of the ones in the last few years that's come along is um, Duloxetine or Cymbalta, and it can be quite effective at dealing with neuropathic pain. Um, we do still have patients where we use the old uh, tricyclic antidepressants, so drugs like amitriptyline that used to be used. You know, so there's a variety of drugs, and it's. A, um, I work with a uh, Dr. Slavin, and often uh, what she says is it isn't a one size fits all. She used to use this analogy of, you know, I can talk to you and I can hear about your pain and I can come up with a, a plan, but until you try it, I don't really know how it's going to work. So I often say to patients, we need to be prepared that things will often need to be adjusted over a, a period of time to get bring things under control. So it's a, I'm hearing it's often individualized. Uh, Very. Very much based on on the type of pain, the origin of the pain, your culture, your personality, a lot of, a lot of complex factors, so it's, it's non-simple. Now, we're gonna take a brief break now, and uh, we'll be back in a moment to delve more into particularly the opioid use and how concerns about the opioid epidemic are negatively impacting the ability to manage patients with cancer and pain, but we'll be right back. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous supporters. Hutton Family Fund and Banco Creative Studio who helped make the Cancer Assist podcast possible. The Cancer Assistance Program is as busy as ever, providing essential support to patients and their families. We remain committed to providing free services for patients in our community, including transportation and equipment loans, personal care and comfort items, parking, and practical education. These services are made possible by the generosity of our donors through one-time gifts, monthly donations, third-party fundraising, corporate sponsorships, and volunteer opportunities. Visit CancerAssist.ca to see how you can make a difference in the lives of cancer patients and their families. Well, we're back uh, talking with uh, Deb Evans, a specialist in uh, pain management from the Jurabinsky Cancer Center. And 
we were um, talking about opioids and just getting into the topic of how it's become more difficult, in fact, to prescribe opiates because they've been used and abused and now more highly regulated um, because of the epidemic of uh, abuse that's leading to a lot of deaths in our country and the country below us and probably elsewhere in the world. And maybe just to start into it, um, I, I remember back when I was practicing in Ottawa that we were concerned to dispel the morphine myths, they were called, that uh, morphine would addict you, morphine would depress your respirations uh, seriously, morphine would cause other problems. And we worked hard to try and get people to actually use morphine, a narcotic, an opioid, to manage cancer pain. And now it's almost like we've gone <laughs> too far the other way. And I'd really like to hear your perspective, uh, Deb, on, on the current situation and, and, and how easy or hard it is for a cancer patient who really needs opioids to gain access to them. I think what I have seen over the last few years is it has become more of a challenge. Um, there are more physicians that are really worried, particularly family physicians who can be the front line and who's prescribing. They worry about starting opioids. They worry about escalating doses to get pain managed. Um, once you get within the cancer center, there can still be some of the physicians there that are very reluctant to prescribe opioids. Um, I think if you're a cancer patient, um, going to your appointments at the JCC and you're having lots of difficulty with pain that you're having trouble getting managed is asking for a referral to somebody who is really used to doing the pain and symptom management, who could really sit with you and talk to you about your pain and get things under better control. One of the things I've heard from family physicians is that you know, a certain level of morphine, for example, is as much as they can give. And they'll tell the patient, well, you can't have more than that. But in fact, a certain tolerance develops. When you have serious pain and you're on a dose of morphine, we'll control it for a while, and then you'll get breakthrough pain, and then you need an escalation. And sometimes the escalations can get up to very high levels, but it's appropriate for that individual, right? Yes. And, and certainly in terms of that, um, the the uh, feeling that there's an upper limit above which you can't go comes out of guidelines that were passed for what's called chronic non-cancer pain um, that were published uh, in 2016, I believe, and actually have been updated this year. Um, and there's really been a concern even amongst the professional uh, people that deal with this that the original guidelines were misapplied to give concrete upper limits of what you could provide and that that was never what they were intended to do. Um, I think I, what I often will say to patients is you need the dose to manage your pain to allow you to be able to do the things in your life that you need to do, the, you know, bathing, of getting out, of looking around, uh, looking after things around the house, of being able to visit with family and friends. Um, I don't promise patients that I'm going to take all of their pain away because, as I say to patients, and as uh, Dr. Evans said earlier, we all have pain. I, you know, we all live with a certain amount of just aches and pains that we can manage. The goal isn't to take that away. It, it's to make it so that you can enjoy your life and to be able to do the things you need to do. So I, I, we're in this dilemma now, it seems to me, where it's become extremely hard to do the right thing for patients. Um, that, that uh, if a patient has pain that gets breaks through on a weekend, um, you can't find a provider who can actually write a prescription for it or a pharmacist who will fill it uh, because of all of these anxieties about abuse now. The pendulum so far to one side. Um, I think this must be a real problem for patients and probably leads to individuals coming into emergency with 
uh, uncontrolled pain and, and really in need of help. And the difficulty, even when they come in to emerge, is they get given a dose or two, the pain comes down, and they get sent home with the same thing they had coming in, and so they still have the same problem, and so it's often not a long-term solution. My best advice is for you to be calling your um, oncology team to talk to them as soon as you are aware that you're beginning to have problems with pain that's not managed. Don't wait until Friday night at 9 o'clock when you're going to be stuck to the weekend. If you know on Wednesday and Thursday that your pain seems to be getting worse and the meds you have aren't helping, you need to reach out to somebody to get help. Now, we've been talking a fair bit about morphine because that's kind of been the backbone of narcotic treatments for a lot of cancer over time. But fentanyl, probably everybody's heard about fentanyl now because of all of the uh, 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 deaths from fentanyl use. And yet it's an, uh, also an excellent drug for treating most or a lot of cancer pain. Um, it's more potent than uh, morphine as I understand it. And it can be given by different routes, which are quite advantageous. So what's, uh, what's the story on fentanyl, its access uh, uh, now and, and, and how does it compare to the fentanyl that's on the street that people are dying from? Yeah, well I think the fentanyl on the street is um, imported from China for largely, it's probably imported from other places too, but um, it, it comes in a pill format and it doesn't have precise dosing uh, amounts with it. People are using it for non-medical reasons as well, and they're using it not under supervision, and so they run into the risks of taking doses that can be dangerous and cause sudden death. Um, the fentanyl that we use medically, we use it for several procedures, is used under medical supervision. It is like any pain medication. It needs to be dosed properly. Um, it needs to be, we need to evaluate how the patient is responding to it to know, um, you know, how it's affecting their mental status, their pain, their breathing, all of those things. If we start at the low doses and gradually escalate, it shouldn't be any more of a problem. Um, and often even what we call fentanyl on the street is a related drug that's even stronger than the fentanyl we use uh, within the hospital or medical system. So <clears throat> it's had a negative impact though, hasn't it, in terms of the way people react to the whole pain issue. And, and it seems to me maybe it's driven people uh, in a couple of new and perhaps not desirable directions if your pain's not being well controlled because your physician's worried about either the dose of drug or worried about prescribing fentanyl because of all the adverse publicity, <coughs> etc. then your pain's poorly controlled. Maybe you're thinking I should, uh, maybe I should get some cannabis because you've heard from your friend down the street that it helps to control pain. And and at the extreme, if you're really not getting good pain control, and I really think that this has been a problem in the past, maybe you think it's life's just not worth suffering on with this pain and cancer, and, and you consider uh, medical assistance and dying or made. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it strikes me that these are sort of two of the potentially negative consequences of all the focus on the abuse of narcotics and this mm -hmm. importation of uh, fentanyl and the misuse of uh, Percodine in the past. Yeah. Um, certainly, I would say over the last 15 years, um, I have seen an explosion in um, patients both asking about and utilizing cannabis. Um, initially, it seemed to be uh, with a fair bit of medical supervision when cannabis was not a legal product available. Um, but over the last few years, as cannabis has become legal, um, patients access it without any supervision. Uh, they can get it from a friend. They can get it from a recreational provider. And so there are a number of concerns with that. Um, 
I think it is extremely important that if you're accessing cannabis that you are discussing that with your um, oncologist and any other of the, the people in your medical team because it is still a chemical you're putting in your body. It is still going to have the effects you want, but it will also have undesired effects. It may have interactions with medications you're taking. One of our big concerns right now is how it might interact with immune therapies. And so you want to be careful that the things you're using are not impeding or working against your cancer treatments. And so it's important to talk to your oncologist about it. Um, I would say the other th uh, things that I see is that frequently what I hear from patients or even more often their family members is this feeling that cannabis is safe. It's natural, so it must be safe. Um, and often what I have to explain to people is that there are several things in the environment that if we were to go out and consume them, let's say hemlock, um, that we would die. And so just because it comes from nature doesn't make it safe. People also will say, well, you know, you say that because, you know, you're pushing the ph pharmaceuticals um, and that's big business. Well, if we don't think cannabis is big business, we, <laughs> we really are deluding ourselves because it is an incredibly big business. Um, I think the other difficulty in people using cannabis indiscriminately and without guidance is they often don't understand um, how it is going to impact them. So I, I had a uh, patient come in with his daughter um, and she, he was in his early 80s and was quite drowsy when we saw him. And what we actually had figured out is she had given him two um, uh, cannabis cookies, which is in ex like a hugely bigger dose than anybody should ever consume at one time. And particularly if you're what we call naive or you haven't used cannabis in the past. And so it's important to understand, you know, how it works, what the doses are. And I think our other areas of concern really is that we aren't, as a cancer center, I would never want to promote smoking it. Um, it seems somewhat counterintuitive to me to be pursuing treatment to treat a cancer while doing something else that may be uh, causing further risk to develop cancers. And so um, I think if we are using it, it should be used in a more oral format, but I would recommend medical guidance around dosing and how to start it. Um, cannabis is a complex product. It isn't just one thing. Um, it varies in the components that go into it that affect how it works with you. And I think sometimes sitting down with someone who is very skilled at um, identifying what type of cannabis product might work to help with the symptoms you're experiencing can be quite worthwhile. It's interesting you raised the issue about <clears throat> cannabis potentially interacting with the, the, the treatments that patients are receiving because um, certainly we're aware of how tobacco smoke and nicotine alter uh, the metabolism of drugs mm -hmm. and uh, can reduce their effectiveness uh, quite substantially and actually impact on overall survival. Yeah. And I think we're still at the early beginnings of generating information and knowledge about the impacts of cannabis. Uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, I know, because I'm involved in some research projects of uh, starting to, ca to, to quantify this uh, impact, and, and, and we still have a long way to go to know, but I, 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 I totally share your concern that there may well be important interactions that ultimately may are detrimental to the treatment of the cancer. Now, I touched on uh, the other issue about MADE, <laughs> and I guess 
to show my biases. I, I, I really think that in um, some large measure, we ended up with made in Canada. <laughs> that sounds odd, doesn't it? Made in Canada. Um, because we have limited palliative care resources and limited numbers of people who provided quality end of life care, including pain management, leaving um, a legacy of uh, a lot of suffering. Uh, a lot of, um, of individuals are aware how their, their parents or their loved ones uh, died uh, with uncontrolled pain and so on. And I think uh, modern pain management uh, applied by people who actually understand pain management could have eliminated almost all of that. And so we've ended up now uh, using a technique that perhaps uh, is maybe desired by some, but, but is uh, a bit unnatural. And it's curious that Canada sort of moved to the front of all nations in, in using MAID at end of life, whereas perhaps patients are being robbed of time and quality of life because they just haven't had access to uh, experts who can manage pain and other symptoms of, of uh, end-stage cancer more effectively. I... You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> MAID is a different, difficult uh, situation. I would say that I have been involved in discussions with many, many patients about it. Um, I would say m many fewer patients actually end up pursuing it than ask about it. Um, I think for many patients, what helps them is to have a conversation to understand what dying naturally might look like and what we might be able to do to help them through that process. I do talk to people about the value of that time of dying. It really is a time in our life where we are to, that we should, or for most people, they're going to take the time to thank people that it, in their life, to tell people they love them and to um, resolve uh, conflicts that might have existed and to prepare their family to go on without them. And there is value to that time. Um, there, I would say people pursue MAID not just for pain, but for many complex um, psychosocial, spiritual um, dimensions. My biggest concern is are people a, having the access to palliative care to make sure that that everything that can be done to maximize their quality of life uh, is being done before we jump to this very final um, option uh, and the the person here asked us to dis to uh, define made it's medical assistance in dying so it's when a doctor, uh, gives you medications that will bring about the immediate end of your life. Um, in my experience, there are very few patients where we actually probably would need to do that. I think for many patients, we can bring their symptoms under better control. Um, some of it is about a societal attitude towards dying um, and frailty, quite frankly. We are a bit of a... Uh, quick fix it society we we don't want to have to go through those periods where we're less than what we envision our, ourselves to be i think in fact many of us think we're going to die quite suddenly that we will be well up until the time you know that the that you know die. some power strikes down and we will die on the spot and for most of us that is not it's going not to be the, the case right, right. Well, I, I think our, our uh, thinking on that is quite similar. I, I, I do think there's a place for it, and I've seen some examples where it's been right for the family, right for the individual, and so I wouldn't totally dismiss it. But my, my point was I think we are probably using it more than we could or should because we're not doing well, as you've described, in supporting the patients and all of their physical symptoms and 
mental and spiritual uh, supports as well. And uh, it's clearly an area where there's opportunity for improvement, especially in pain. Uh, just, just to make the point um, that, that it's rare that people have totally uncontrolled pain. It's not zero. I've seen patients mm-hmm. who had pain that had no, despite massive amounts of narcotics, did not crack it. So there are rare instances where pain is uncontrollable, but I guess the point to make is it's pretty rare. It is fairly rare, and in those circumstances, prior to medical assistance in dying uh, being an available option, we did what we would refer to as terminal sedation, as we gave people enough medication to basically make them unconscious so that they weren't suffering uh, through that symptom, but it didn't bring about their immediate death. Um, and in those situations, there would be the opportunity to lift the sedation from time to time um, so that we could see, you know, whether that was still what the patient wanted, what the family wanted. So this is a complicated area. It's not as simple answers, but what one of the key themes here is sort of the individualization of, of the care for the person with cancer who is suffering from pain. And I think over the course of this podcast, you've heard about different types of pain, both those caused by cancer, those caused by treatment, and the variety of interventions that are uh, possible to help control pain, some of them quite simple over-the-counter medications, others requiring uh, physician support uh, and prescription and uh, careful monitoring. But I think that uh, it's certainly great that we have in our community specialists who manage like yourself, Deb, and and I really want to thank you for bringing your expertise to this podcast and enlightening our audience about the uh, various aspects of cancer pain. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Cancer Assist podcast. Find more episodes, resources, and information at cancerassist.ca or follow the Cancer Assistance Program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you next time.